Welcome to the preaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the truth of God's Word without compromise, raising up disciples who through faith in God will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed and refreshed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Psalm 22. I finished before I left a single message I did that I encouraged everybody in this church family to get. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of who have already gotten it, but I want everybody to get it. And it was talking about the power of intercession. And it was a single message I did two weeks ago Wednesday that you need to have and you need to hear. And it will truly help you and bless you if you'll apply it. And it will not only bless you, but it will bless our church family and many others as well. Praise God. I had finished our series we were on before that. So this is a brand new series that I've been actually praying over and and, uh, talking to God about for some time. And uh, for those of you that are note takers, I'll give you a title as we always like to. The title of this message is Psalm 23, The Day We Live In. Psalm 23, the day we live in. When I had uh, had the privilege of having Dr. Sutton as one of my spiritual fathers, you know, one of the things that you get in times of privacy with your spiritual dads is you get to talk about things that God's speaking to them about. And you get to glean from them. And, you know, part of what we know as ministers of God is the truth is, you know, it used to be an old saying, you know, well, don't steal somebody else's message. Well, if they got it from God, it wasn't theirs to begin with anyway. It was the Holy Ghost. And one of the things I learned from Dr. Sutton that I sincerely did not know because of his studies of Old Testament scriptures and prophecies, prophetic scriptures, etc., is that uh, Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24 line up together as prophetic psalms. Now, we know that a lot of the psalms are prophetic, and there's a lot of prophecies in the psalms, but these psalms specifically speak of three time frames that fall together. Psalm 22, as I'm about to show you, was prophetic of the day that Jesus lived in. Psalm 23 is the day you and I live in, and thus the reason that actually, in, uh, you know, when Dr. Sutton overcame his battle with cancer, by the way, and he did overcome his battle with cancer, uh, it's not why he passed away. When he overcame his battle with cancer, the first message he preached was in this church, and it was on Psalm 23. He had never got the revelation that God was just beginning to show him about Psalm 23. I believe as a son in the faith, what he began, God began to birth into my heart a message about that, and I began to talk him about it, pray about it, study it. And obviously it's something God needs the body to hear right now because Psalm 23 is where we're living in prophetically right now. So there's a lot for us to be gleaning from Psalm 23. And then Psalm 24 is prophetic of the Lord's return. Now I'll show you some verses that reveal this to you so you realize we're not just saying so. Psalm 22 verse 1 says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do those words sound familiar? Whose, were, whose words were those? Jesus. Now realize this was written, you know, years and years and years before Jesus ever went to the cross by David, Psalm of David, but obviously prophetic of what Jesus would uh, declare and proclaim on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning. Now, why would he say that? Because Jesus knew, like I've told you many times, that he was about to be separated from the presence of the Father. He had never experienced that ever. Right. Never. And that's why he's so agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane over all that prayer time, because he'd never experienced ever being separated from the presence of God. So this is actually him on the cross crying out to what we know, obviously, was that time of separation. Drop down to verse 14 for the sake of time. Verse 14 in that same chapter, he goes on to say, And I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint, and my heart is like wax, it is melted within me. Why, Pastor? Because he was taking upon himself all of our sin, that which separated us from God. He was taking upon himself all of our punishment, that which we deserve. Verse 15, he goes on and says, My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. God the Father brought him to the dust of death for me and you. 16, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. 
I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Verse 18 is what, of course, the, the uh, soldiers did uh, at the time when he was on the cross casting lots for his garment. Which, by the way, if you don't know, <clears throat> why would they cast lots for his garment? I'm going to tell you why. Uh, Roman soldiers wanted nothing to do with poor people's clothes, but when they saw very wealthy people being crucified, they wanted their clothes because they were very expensive uh, clothing. Uh, that's a whole other story in itself, but that's why they cast lots for his garment. So very clearly, verse, uh, excuse me, Psalm 22 is a prophetic psalm of the day of which Jesus lived and ruled directly relating to the cross. Drop down to verse 30 of the same psalm. A posterity shall serve him. It will be reckon, uh, reckon, recounted, excuse me, of the Lord to the next generation. That's us. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. Declaring that we would proclaim his righteousness through his salvation. And therefore people would what? Be born again and that he has accomplished this work. So very clearly Psalm 22 was of Jesus' day. Prophetic of Jesus' day. Now go to Psalm 24. Because of course we're going to get into Psalm 23. Go to Psalm 24 verse 1. And I'll show you that this is prophetic of the actual return of the Lord. Everybody say the return of the Lord. Of the Lord. <clears throat> Which by the way is soon in Jesus' name. Yes. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Now, why is this speaking about the return of the Lord? God does not want you to forget who owns everything. In the midst of all the darkness in the earth, don't lose hope in what's going on around you to think all of a sudden, you know, God doesn't really have any control over what's going on anymore. And listen, he's not making the decisions of the wicked, but I will promise you his return is on his timetable and nobody else's. Don't fall for the old teaching that until we preach this gospel in all the world, Jesus won't come back. Uh, their theology is a little off kilter there, a little off timing there. Because this gospel will also be preached during the tribulation period, by the way. So it's not referring to the fact that until we preach the gospel to everybody, he won't come and get his church. He's coming before that actually happens in a fulfillment anyway. So the earth is the Lord's and the fullness and its fullness, the world and all those who dwell, all those who dwell therein. Verse 2, for he is founded upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who, now notice this, because this is talking about us getting caught up with the Lord. Who may ascend then into the hill of the Lord? Who's going to go? Who's going to go during that rapture? He's about to tell you. Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. <clears throat> Not just he who has a pure heart. Not just he who's born again. This time out the rapture. This, this time out what happens before the seven years of tribulation. Psalm 24 is prophetic of the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ taking the church out of the earth, coming back and taking the church. Who may ascend into that hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place or in His presence? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, watch this, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Now, I'd like to preach on this, but this is not my topic. You can study it for yourself, but to lift up your soul to an idol means that you have made a God to fit you. That's right. You may claim he's the God of heaven. You may, you know, obviously you may claim Jesus is your savior and that I serve God and I love God. But the truth is Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commandments. Right. If you're not obeying Jesus' commandments, you obviously don't love him according to his word. So you've made a God to fit you. That's an idol. See, people only think of idolatry as, well, their cars, their idol, or their homes, their idol, or their money could be included, no doubt. But what people don't think about idolatry is they could actually make a God that they say is the God of this Bible to fit them, to actually fit their lifestyle and what they want of Him. That's what the Seeker Friendly Church is doing today. They're claiming that obviously there's what's known as antinomianism. And that simply has been around all the way back to the Bible days. It's in Scripture, by the way, of people who claimed after the salvation of the Lord, I'm saved by grace. It doesn't matter how I live. That's not new, folks. It's in the Bible. The word's actually in the Bible and referred to in Scripture. This was where Paul addressed in the Roman church this issue in Romans 6, verse 1. Because he talked about where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. But in Romans 6, he says, so should we continue in sin? And the answer... He was dealing with antinomianism in his day. 
because antinomianism meant, well, I'm saved by grace, man. I can sin. Doesn't matter what I do. I'm not bound by this law and under the law anymore and all that stuff. I'm just free. I got, I'm free to do whatever I want to do because of the grace of God. And Paul was addressing that back in his day. The Bible says, ain't nothing new under the sun. What has been will be. So realize Psalm 24 is telling us some clues about who's going to go in that rapture. Poke your neighbor next to you and say, that would be me in Jesus' name. <clears throat> so realize it's not just a born-again experience, praise God. There's some things we need to do. <clears throat> I want to get to a little phrase the Lord gave me today, but I'll, I'll, I'll preserve it here for a minute. Watch this, verse 5. He, talking about those who will get caught up with the Lord, shall receive what? Blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Look at verse 6. This is a powerful verse. If you've never studied it, we've looked at it in times past in some other messages. This is Jacob, the generation of those who do what? Underline that, please. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek his face. What, what Satan knows all too well, unfortunately, I was talking about this with my sister-in-law today. What Satan knows all well, uh, more than a lot of people, a lot of believers do today, is the church now for probably at least 10 years, probably more, but at least 10 years, has been preaching a self-help gospel. It's all about the promises of God. It's all about what God can do for you. Now listen, I'm all for the promises of God and I'm all for what God can do for you. But when you go back to the, the days of Paul and what Paul preached, and Paul did talk about the promises, but the primary focus of Paul's messages was not to chase the promises, but to chase God. Right. It's not about what God can do for me if I come and get born again. Right. It's about the fact that I could even know him and have a relationship with him. Right. The reason we've got a lot of quote unquote so-called believers today that are not walking out what we're about to teach in Psalm 23 and thus missing out on a lot of what God has for them is because they've come to God for what He can do for them. Right. They've come to God for what they can get from Him. That He'll take care of me. He'll provide for my needs. He'll heal my body. Now, wait a minute. You against those things, Pastor? Oh, Lord, no. I'm, I'm grateful for all of them. <clears throat> but I have found that when people come to God for the benefits and not for the relationship, they won't serve Him. Right. Because you're never going to get the benefit without learning to serve Him. It's not about us focusing on the benefit. It's a byproduct of your relationship with God. Amen. The key is, is that we're supposed to serve Him. The Apostle Paul put it this way, the love of Christ, not the benefits. The love of Christ compels me. In other words, the word compel there in the Greek, it's what constrains me. It has put me under a restraint in my life to serve Jesus Christ. He went on to say that all of us who are born again should not live for us, but for him who died for us. Amen. And Paul said the thing that caused him to do that was the love of Christ. Is God not love? Yes. And it's all about that relationship God has for us. Amen? Amen? So when you and I understand that it's about a relationship and it's not about the promises, it's not about what he can give us, it's about the love he's shown us. I can testify in my life, and I know some of others that I know as well. When I came to God, I did not come to God for the benefit. I didn't come for what He could give me. I didn't come for healing. I didn't come for money. I didn't come for anything of the benefits of what He had for me. Actually, and I, I didn't have anybody preaching to me the benefits. I, I thankfully had a man of God named Coy Huffman talking about the relationship God had for me and the fact that I could have one. I was shocked you could. I was amazed that God would have anything to do with me, right. that I could know Him that I could even get to know God and have a relationship with Him? How do you do that? I'd never heard about Jesus Christ. And when I found out I could do that through Jesus Christ, I was like, you're kidding. He would have me. He would have something to do with me. You know, the Bible says to whom much is forgiven, they love much. Right. And I think the reason a lot of Christians don't love God as much as they think they do is because they don't realize how much they've been forgiven. <clears throat> What I mean by that is not to put us down or put us in a bad position, but when you think about your sin and the punishment you deserved, that all of us deserved, that every one of us deserved, amen, and that Jesus took that for us, the proof of God's love. Yes. Yes. Wow, man, have I been forgiven a lot. Yes. And, and, you know, even from a perspective, when you think of a lot, I'm not talking about being in the sense of society, one of the worst people. That's not the, that, that's the wrong connotation of the Bible. Yes. It's a revelation that without him, I would have been damned for eternity. Without him, I would have never had known him or never had new life. And I've been forgiven much. Can you say amen? 
But I'm going to get into this. I want you to see this. Very important. But I want to finish this here real quick. So, going to receive blessing from the Lord. Those are those, verse 6, who seek His face, not His hands, not what He can do for you, but the relationship. That's the focus. 7. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Why? Because the King of glory shall do what? What will He do? And that He is going to do exactly that. Who is the King of glory? He is the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory should do what? In case you didn't get it the first time. What do you mean, lift up uh, your heads? Listen, the Bible says when you see the things of the last days happening, and ladies and gentlemen, they are happening, the Bible says to look up. Now, looking up doesn't mean, okay, now listen, here's what you got to do now, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You got to walk like this. I got to look up because Jesus is coming. No, look up means get your eyes off of this stinking world, get your eyes off of the influence of this world, and get your eyes on God. When the Bible talks about you and I seeing these last day's events, things happening, if you don't know what's going on right now with Israel, if you don't know what's going on with Syria, if you don't know what's going on with all these different areas in Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and around them, ladies and gentlemen, wake up. Because as you start seeing the signs of wars and rumors of wars, we are about to enter into World War III. I don't necessarily mean us per se. I don't know that. I'm just telling you the world is. We're right on the verge of it, man. I guarantee you if, you. if you don't know that, you've been asleep. Some of you have been sticking something in your coffee. I'll guarantee you what. Uh, we're that close. It's going to happen any time. But you and I, thank God, are going to get the opportunity to get raptured off of this planet, praise the Lord. And the Bible told us when you start seeing all these end time things happen, make sure, listen to me, make sure you're not focused on this earth. Make sure you're looking to your God. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Watch this. Lift up your heads, verse 7, 8. Who, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. 9. Lift up your heads again. 10. Who is the King of glory? He is the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Say he's coming back for his church. Amen. Now go to Psalm 23. Thessalonians says that when he comes back, those who are alive and remain. Two key words. Alive and and remain shall be caught up with him. The term alive there doesn't mean physically breathing because he's talking about the rapture here. So it's a given that when he comes, those who are obviously still physically alive are going to go if they are alive in him. Alive here means to have new life in Christ, but they also got to remain. And remain what? Faithful to him. Faithful to walk with him. I was, I was uh, spending some time this morning in the Word and talking to the Lord, and the Holy Spirit just spoke this to me, man. It just lit me up. I get stuff. I got to start posting on Facebook, you know, and everything. And I, it just lit me up, to, you know, because what we got with such a self-propagated gospel today, and, and it's all about you can't earn anything from God, and, you know, God just gives you everything and all this stuff. But then it goes on with, but it, and it doesn't matter how you live because it's all by grace. And, but the Lord spoke to me this morning. He said, I want you to never forget this. You don't earn anything from me. You learn from me. You don't come to earn from me, but you do come to learn from me. And see, what we're missing in the church today is we do have strong preaching on you don't earn anything from Jesus. But you know what we don't have strong preaching on? We don't have strong preaching on learning from Jesus. He's the example. He's who we're supposed to follow after. He's the molder of our life. He's the one that makes us what he wants us to be if we'll let him. And it's vitally important you and I learn that truth. I'm going to tell you something. I'm about to go through Psalm 23, and I'm going to show you some awesome things that God has available to us in this day you and I live in. And as a pastor, I want you to get everything God has for you. But I'll tell you what, one of the reasons why a lot are not is because they're not seeing Jesus as the shepherd of their life. They know that I can't earn anything from God, but are we learning from him? Are we learning from Jesus? Remember what Jesus said? He said, you come to me and you learn of me. Right? You take my yoke upon you and you learn of me. So realize that when we come to Jesus, are we earning anything from him? Lord, no. You couldn't earn anything that he died and paid for. But you know how you get into it? You got to learn how to be a partaker of it. You got to learn how to get a hold of what God wants for your life. See, before you knew Jesus, you didn't know how to do that. If you'd have known how to do that, you wouldn't have needed Jesus. The reason you want to learn from him is you want to learn, now, how do I get healed? 
How do I raise my kids godly? How do I stay separate from the world? How do I remain ready for the rapture? How do I do the work of Jesus in the earth? How do I walk in His footsteps? Amen. you got to learn that stuff. I said, you got to learn that stuff. Amen. Did y'all lose your amen when I was gone? See, I know these guys don't deal with you to amen, but I ain't going to change, man. I'm going to keep on. I know they're, they're, they're nice to you, man. They're just, you know, real nice. Fetch in. Psalm 23. Say, this is where we're living right now. Now, I need to read through the whole psalm, and then I'm going to focus on a key area tonight. We'll just move through it as we, as we go along. Psalm 23, verse 1. So, you got to remember, 22 is prophetic of... Day Jesus was on the earth. 24, prophetic of rapture of the church. 23 is where we are right now. Watch this. 23, the Lord is my shepherd. That's who he's supposed to be now. The Lord is my shepherd. Before I ever even go any further, Holy Spirit's not even let me go any further. A lot of people have met Jesus as their Savior, but they don't know him as their shepherd. And that's why the rest of Psalm 23 ain't working for him. He's got to be more than your Savior. He's got to become your shepherd. How do you get him as your Savior? You recognize the cross. You recognize what he did for us at the cross. I'm like Brother Hagin. The cross religion has been preached far too long. We need to get beyond the cross and get to our place at the throne. But when you get to your place at the throne, it's a surrender. Going to the throne of God is not being pompous and arrogant and I'm going to live my life the way I want to. Going to the throne is recognizing the king that's on that throne and recognizing he's the king over my life. And what a joy, what a privilege that I get to actually sit with him and be a part of the kingdom of God. To be a part of the kingdom of God, you got to learn about the king and how he does stuff. Right. This isn't harsh. This isn't critical. This isn't, I want to beat you over the head. Lord, no. God's saying, I want to help you. I want to deliver you. I want to strengthen you. I want to keep you free from sin. Uh, come on, man. It, it, uh, let me finish that verse. I'm not going to get very far. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not what? Yeah. I shall not what? Yeah. Colossians 2.10 says, we're complete in Jesus. We're complete in him. It's not your, listen, it's not your vacations that complete you. It's not your toys you have. It's not your things you do. Guess what? It's not even your relationships you have with other people here. Right. What makes you complete? What makes you whole? What makes you what God wants you to be? Jesus. Jesus. He's the only one. Colossians 2.10. We're complete in Him. 9 says that He is the Godhead, all wrapped up in one being, and you and I are complete in Jesus Christ. I can tell you, I had a God bull riding for 16 years of my life. It did not complete me. It always left me wanting more. It didn't matter how far I got in it. It didn't matter how many trophies I won, how many buckles I won. Didn't how much money I matter. Didn't matter how much money I won, how many finals I went to. Even if I'd ever been a world champion, I got a word for you. It had never completed me. Amen. Your job's never going to complete you. Your, your spouse is never going to complete you. If you've been taught you're not complete without being married, that's not true. That's, that scripture doesn't teach that. Jesus is the only thing the Bible says that completes you. Why all this complete stuff? If the Lord your shepherd, you will not want because he will complete you. You won't go through this life down and depressed. I have a good word for you. You won't go through this life frustrated about what you can't get or what you don't have or what you wish you had. Because all of a sudden, that stuff won't mean much to you. Now, all of a sudden, you'll realize where true satisfaction and true joy and true uh, gratification come in life. Yes. Amen. Me sitting on a porch for three days, three hours with God, I had more fun doing that than anything I can tell you. And it wasn't because of the cabin. I mean, the location helped because you're out away from everything. It was because I got to spend time with Him uninterrupted and just sit there and read the Scriptures and talk to God. I love that stuff. I love those times because I know he's the one that makes me complete. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? But here's the cool part. If the, here's the gauge though. But if the Lord's your shepherd, guess what? That means you're not wanting in life. You're not wanting something else life can give you. You already got everything you need. Amen. You got everything you need in Jesus Christ. Not many amens. Amen. What, did you preach them lukewarm? No. <laughs> You're not going to go through this life with want if the Lord is your shepherd. Now, if all he is is your Savior, you're going to keep wanting in life. 
You're not going to feel complete. You're not going to feel satisfied, gratified. You're always going to be trying to get that next experience. Uh, like for me, that next gold buckle, that next paycheck, that next title. I got a word for you guys. It ain't going to, it ain't going to complete you. You're being duped by Satan. Can you say amen? amen? Here's the truth you need to learn. Somebody's shepherding your life. That's right. Yes. Yep. Someone That's good word. yes, yes. There ain't a person on the planet that don't have a shepherd. All of you have a shepherd. Somebody. Now, here's the analogy that Jesus is giving. A shepherd leads you. Well, nobody's leading me. I could spend about five or ten minutes with you in a conversation and immediately tell you who's leading your life. Amen. Whether you realize it or not. Right. But somebody's leading you. Whoever has this right here, by the way, for those that are listening, not watching, right. whoever has my ear has my heart, and they're leading me. That's right. right. Because the analogy here is a shepherd, meaning one that does what? In the days of Jesus, and still today in places like Israel, like I saw many times when I was in Israel, shepherds still go up to folds. Everybody say folds. Do you understand the difference between a flock and a fold? Well, in case you don't, let me explain it. All of us are part of the flock of God. Right. Everybody in the body of Christ, universal on the planet, is a part of God's flock. Right. But we're supposed to be a part of a fold. Yes. A fold is a church. Right. A fold is a local shepherd over our life that Jesus is going to use to help shepherd us as well, which I can't even get time into in this area. I've taught on it many times. But the point is God wants you as a part of a fold. Shepherds oftentimes kept their sheep together in huge, massive pens as a flock. But the shepherds would go in and call their sheep by name, those of their fold. And when they called them out of the pen, those sheep were so used to hearing that shepherd's voice because he would talk to them all the time and they would listen. Right. And, and as he would walk out in front of them, guess what the sheep did? Follow. Guess what sheep do? Follow. They follow. follow. And they follow who's shepherding them. You're following who's shepherding you. Amen. And God says he wants Jesus to be our shepherd, not just our savior, our shepherd. And he is our shepherd is going to lead us out of the fold. As you'll read further in Psalm 23, he's going to take us into green pastures. Right. He's going to take us beside still waters. Yes. Let me read the rest of this verse because I'll probably never get through it if I don't. Psalm 23, verse 2, he makes me. Watch that. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Well, he don't do that for me, pastor. He, he does if he's your shepherd. That's right. See, if he's just your savior, you know you're missing out on that. We'll talk more about those things as we go along. The, the focus tonight is him being your shepherd, not your savior. Right. If you hadn't got that point yet, that's the whole focus of tonight. I don't want him just as my savior. I need him as my savior to get him as my shepherd. Yes. Right. How do you get him as your savior? You got to have revelation of the cross and what happened at the cross. That's right. You come to the cross to receive him as your savior, right? What he did in Psalm 22. Right. And once you get him as your savior, you go beyond the cross. Don't stay there. Don't live at the cross. Right. Don't live with Jesus just as your savior. Now go with him to the throne of God and get seated next to him as your shepherd over your life, as the king over your life to guide and direct your life. So he says here, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Look at the benefit. For you, my shepherd, my God, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That word comfort's powerful. In the Hebrew, it means to relieve you from stress. Amen. To relieve you from stress. You're stressed out all the time? Come on, darling, listen to me. Man of God, woman of God, hear the word of the Lord. You don't have to live with stress. Get Jesus as the shepherd of your life. You can walk with great peace, great joy. You don't have to live like the world. You, you're going to be in it, but you don't have to be of it. Yeah. What a blessing. Yes. Five, you, the Lord, prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Yeah, we're still surrounded by enemies, but he prepares a table with everything that we need. I can't wait to get to that part. You anoint my head with oil. Your cup runs, excuse me, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall do what? Follow, Follow me. Follow who though? The 
The sheep that's following him as the shepherd. See, all the rest of the psalm from verse 2 down is the benefit of him being your shepherd, not just your savior. See, the reason a lot of other people aren't partaking of what's on that table, he's not their shepherd yet. He can be, though. He's just their savior. Thank God for that. Thank God they'll make heaven. But I want him to be my shepherd. Yes. I want to sit at that banqueting table every day. Amen. I want to experience God's goodness and mercy every day. Yes. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Oh, are you ready for this? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Now nah, we better not read the last part of that verse. You really want me to read it? Yes. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, there's different people will say, well, that house of the Lord isn't the church. I can prove to you the Bible says it is. it is. The house of the Lord is the place that God called you to come and assemble and to be a part of a church family. If the Lord's your shepherd, you're not living out there in the world and skipping church. Good if the Lord's your shepherd, you're living in this is Psalm 23 is not what's to come. It's Let me remind you, Psalm 23 is today. It's not what's to come. Right. Psalm 24 is the rapture. Well, that's talking about being with God forever. No, it's not. Psalm 23 is today. It's prophetic for today. And when the Lord is your shepherd, one of the things that will be revealing of that is guess what you do? You live in God's house. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What? For all the days of this Psalm 23 church age. So that is a par powerful part of what we can walk in as children of God. And I don't really want to focus a lot on these blessings and stuff because I think there's been too much focused on it. We're going to talk about them, but I want to focus about the key to this whole thing. And it starts right there in verse 1. Is he your shepherd? And if he is, what do we do to keep him as that? What do we do to make sure we keep him as our shepherd that we don't get led astray and start following some other shepherd we shouldn't be following? Yes. Some other voice we shouldn't be following? Can you say amen? amen? See, one of the things we're on the verge of today, I honestly do not believe that God is calling me to do so. I do, but I know, well, pastor knows, Dr. Barclay knows, Brother Hagin said, there will come a day, son, that you will have to call preachers out. And you'll have to do it publicly. Brother Hagin told this to Dr. Barclay. He said, son, that day is coming and you will have to declare them as heretics. Mm -hmm. Titus tells us even to do so. Book of Titus says you're to name a heretic, call them out. Not, not, not to try to embarrass them or run them down, but just say that's heresy. If you don't know what heresy is, here's heresy. There will be homosexuals in heaven. That's heresy. That's right. There will be Muslims in heaven. That's heresy. It's being preached. Amen. There is no hell. That's heresy. That's right. Everybody's going to heaven. We're all included. That's heresy. Amen. These are heresies. These are actual beliefs that ministers would stand up and fight you for. That's called heresy, and therefore that makes you a heretic. Because you are misleading people from the truth. That's right. Right. You're saying there will be no homosexuals in heaven? No, sir, because the Bible says there won't be. That's Not, right. I didn't say it. Right. Don't get mad at me. There won't be any fornicators. There won't be any murderers. There won't, there won't be any adulterers. Right. You understand? Yes. There won't be any people practicing those lifestyles. Right. Can you say amen? Amen. Had a conversation with somebody today, and they said, you know, a uh, young man that I know came out of the closet, so to speak, and told everybody, yeah, I'm a homosexual, have been for years. And all his friends, you know, back on Facebook say, man, we're so glad you finally were able to come out about the truth. And, you know, we're just glad that you're no longer bound by having to hide all that stuff. And we're happy for you. And I thank God for this one believer who had enough guts to stand up and say, I love you. I care about you. I'm not happy for you coming out of the closet. I'm, I'm happy that you acknowledge your sin, but not that you're happy about it. Oh, good and, and very cool, very cool doctrine, very cool teaching to this young man. said, listen, it's not about the homosexuality. That's it's that's about right. the sin. That's right. It wouldn't matter if you're an adulterer. That's it wouldn't matter if you're in fornication. It wouldn't matter what you... Listen, this is, this is not true to the Bible, and you've been taught better. That's right. And then they, we got to talking about it, and they asked me about it. And I said, I'm going to tell you right now, they aren't truly born again if they're practicing such a lifestyle. Because once you get born again, it will be very difficult for you to practice such a... We're talking about practicing. Right. Doing what you want to get good at. Right. I like a better amen. amen. We're not talking about a time or a season of deception. We're talking about practicing. Right. 
Right. And I've known people that have actually been delivered from such a lifestyle. Yeah. People oftentimes, you know, put the homosexual thing down. I love what this person told this young man. It's not the homosexuality, it's the sin. It's and it don't matter what we're talking about. Right. You're practicing it and you're proud of it. Yes. And that's a dangerous way to live. Yes. You, need, you need deliverance. You need Jesus Christ in your heart. Right. You need to get born again. And I said, right. bravo. Yeah. And I, uh, they said, but they didn't respond very well and neither did their family. I said, you're, you're, you're being... Uh, recognized in the class of Jesus Christ for preaching the gospel. That's right. For, for being persecuted just like him. Uh, listen, not everybody's going to receive what you have to say. That's right. But it needs to be said. That's right. It's the truth that sets people free. That's right. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, we're in universalism now. It's one of the biggest doctrines going on in the body of Christ. Universalism is, oh, come on, man, we just all love God. Muslims. Uh, Mormons, you know, all, all of us, we're just all in the same thing together. Doesn't matter what background we're from or, or what our beliefs are or whatever. Uh, come on, man. Uh, we just got to all coexist. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, uh, we're not out for creating strife. No. Uh, the Bible says to live peacefully among all men. That doesn't mean coexist in the sense of ecumenical peace. And I'm not going to ever talk to you about your sin because I don't want to get you mad or get you upset. I have a word for you, man. Paul was the greatest preacher of his day. And he got stoned for telling people the truth. Amen. He got beaten with rods and beaten with whips for telling people the truth. He wasn't beating them over the head with the Bible. He was trying to get them delivered from what was actually hurting their life. Amen. Uh, uh, a true shepherd, and, and this is Jesus as the ultimate over shepherd. What's his desire for you? What's Jesus? Why does he want you following him? Why does, why does he want to be the, let's back up. Why does he want to be the shepherd of your life? Now, you know, sheep in following a natural shepherd in a lot of areas where there's actual places they have to get them through rocky cliffs and mountains and stuff like that and little trails that are very tight, you know, tough to get through and stuff. Man, sometimes, just think about it from a sheep's perspective, you know, it get kind of difficult sometimes to think, why are we going through all this? They don't see the grass yet. Right. They don't see the waters yet. But the shepherd knows how to get them there. Right. Jesus knows how to get you there. You got to trust him. You got to learn to say, listen, what, what he leads me through, my flesh isn't going to always like. What he leads me through, sometimes my flesh might even get a little fearful or a little rejective of. But if I keep following his word and doing what he says, he's going to get me to that green pasture. He's going to get me to those still waters. He knows where he's taking me. Amen. Tell somebody, Jesus knows where to take you. Amen. Problem is, he won't force us. That's right. Shepherds don't rope you and drag you where they want you to go. It's a proven fact through history. Most of them would sing or actually read Scripture in the area of uh, Israel. You know, the children of Israel, they'd read Scripture over and over as they're walking out. They'd, they'd quote the Psalms yeah. as they're walking out, you know, taking their sheep out. That's how the sheep would get to know their voice. Because right. they'd hear them over and over and over again so they'd know who to follow. And they just knew, i got to keep listening to that voice and keep following that voice. Yeah. If I keep following that voice, he's going to get me. I just know it, man. We're going to come to that place. We're going to have all that green grass to lie down in and eat, fatten up on, yeah. all that nice still water to drink and get refreshed by and get rested. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. It's going to be a journey getting there. But guess what? As he gets me through those journeys every day, he'll get me to that place where I can be. Yeah. But you got to be able to trust the shepherd. Yeah. Tell somebody you don't need him just as your savior. You need him as your shepherd. So, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that's a key thing. If I am always wanting more out of life, then that should be a wake-up call for me. Don't feel bad about it. Quit. Can, can I kind of just for a moment pull up to a position of a spiritual dad over my church family? And not, this isn't spanking you. This is loving you. This is with a desire to see you do good and be victorious and get free from sin and the things that hurt your life. Could I do that for just a minute without anybody getting hurt or upset or mad or ticked off or offended? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, almost everybody in this room, I know almost every one of your faces, there's a few exceptions. Almost everybody in this room has been born again for a pre pretty good length of time. Amen. Most of you are not baby converts just born again a couple days ago. Right. Now, I know there's some still new believers in the body. Thank God for it. We want to keep seeing people get born again. Yeah. All right? So understand as a baby Christian, although some of the baby Christians are doing better, by the way, than some of those that have been around a while. But don't, don't, I'm not, I want to help you, all right? But can I, can I quietly, well, I guess not quietly, can I politely challenge you to take your diapers off, pull the sucky bottle out, and let's, let's do some great stuff for God. Amen. Let's quit thinking about all the little hurts of our life and the stuff that we're focused on that's only going to rob us of our true joy and our true peace in God. 
and let's become this powerful army that Jesus died and paid for. And let's accomplish some awesome things for God. I'm not saying we're not. I'm just saying let's pull our bootstraps up. Let's, qu let's quit acting like the world. Let's quit allowing what other people say offend us, including in the church especially. Yeah. Let's, let's quit getting upset at mad at each other, mad at your pastor, mad at your spouse, mad at your, at your neighbor sitting next to you or somebody else in the church or upset about what they said or something they did. I have another word for you. God forbid you're going to ever agree with everything I ever say. Boy, isn't that the goal? If you think you're going to agree with everything I'm ever going to say, you, you've already been deceived. Because I have been challenged by my pastor with stuff that he said at times that I've thought, ooh, I don't know if I can agree with that. But I'm smart enough to know he's done this longer than I have, and I'm going to pray about it, and I'm going to get in the Word, I'm going to study it for myself, and I'm going to let God speak to me about it, because God's simply trying to show me something or help me with something. He's trying to help grow me up, make me a little better, a little better of, a, of a pastor, a little better of a man of God. So I guess the polite word is, could we please pull our spiritual bootstraps up, put our suspenders on, sh throw our shoulders back, look up as the body of Christ, the soldiers God made us to be, quit allowing offense to ever get into our life because it's not given, it's taken. Quit allowing the enemy to separate you from whom God put around your life to help you. Get separated from the ones that aren't helping us that are out here in the world that are hurting our life and become the incredible army of God that Jesus Christ can use to lay hands on the sick, to cast out demons, and preach this gospel. Yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. Listen, come on, man. Look what Paul went through. But these light afflictions. When we're all caught up in what we're going through, I have a word. I have a word for you. You're not walking as a child of God that God made you to be. You're focused on the wrong person. You. You get focused on Jesus, He can get you through anything. Man, some of you are military people and some of you know about the military. I'm going to tell you what, if you had a good commander over your troop, those guys could convince you to almost overcome any obstacle you face. Right. We've got the greatest commander there's ever been in all of history, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is the head of the body of Christ. He can get you through anything. But he can't if you are going to cause him to try to force you to do it. He's not going to do it. Right. You know what it, I keep saying it's time, and I want, to, I want to stop using this phrase, it's time to grow up. I want to stop using that phrase. I want to say, we've grown up. We've grown up. Yes. Yes. We've grown up. We're spiritually mature. We're not carnal fleshly Christians anymore. The Lord is our shepherd. He guides us and leads us, and we love it, and we want to change, and we want to see Him direct us into what we want to do, walk in the light of His Word, and benefit of all that He has for us as children of God. But if the focus is, yeah, I want those benefits, you're not going to do it. That's right. You're not going to do it. Good word. Why is our military one of the strongest in the world? It ain't their pay. No. That's right. <laughs> it ain't like, hey, come on, man, you really want to go through this training because look what we're going to pay you. No. no. It ain't the pay. It's not really any in the aspect of what the Army has to offer, any benefit of what the Army, Marines, or Navy has to offer. <laughs> right. You know what it's about? It's about a heart that believes in what you and I have had as a country for over 200 years, freedom. That wants to serve a country, willing to even die if need be, so that we can protect our values and what we believe. How much more should we as Christians not protect the values of this Bible and be willing to die to self and become this incredible mighty army of God? Can you say amen? Because you know what? What gets really tiring for a pastor is when you have to try to fight to keep people in your church. And I have an announcement to my church. I'm not doing that anymore. Right. I'm sticking with what Brother Evans told me. You keep driving this bus, son. Amen. I love every one of you. I don't want to see anybody go. But I'm not going to spend my time trying to keep people in my church. I'm going to spend time raising up men of God and women of God who want to be disciples, who want to be victorious over your life and your family's life, who want to put the devil where he belongs and keep him there under your feet in Jesus' name, where you're free from all the garbage of the world that's held you bound. Can you say amen? amen? And then we don't just become individually strong. We become a mighty force together as a church family. And we really start impacting our community and our world. Right. Not like we're not, but we need to be doing a whole lot more. We need to be doing a whole lot better. Yeah, but I got stuff to do. More important than the Father's business? I mean, this is such a short span of time. You think about it. 
I'm serious. I'm sorry if it bugs you. I don't want to live past 85. If the Lord tarries, I want him. Come, I want out of here. I, I, I don't know why. I just chose it. 85 is my, You can do whatever you want. I want to be 100. Go for it, man. If he tarries that long, I want out of here. I feel like I'll have accomplished what I needed to do best of my ability. I want out of here. But even if you lived 85 years, what is that compared to all of eternity? What's 85 years in all of eternity? Can I ask a question? So let's say you get 100. Let's say you go to 100. If you live 100 years, you're going to come back and rule here for 1,000. You're fighting over something you want to have for the 100 years you're here? And you're going to come and have free access to it for 1,000? See, what I want to see the body of Christ wake up to is he's more than a savior. He's a shepherd. And he doesn't want to just shepherd us. He wants to shepherd hurting, dying people out here. Amen. Goes far beyond us. Right. And you'll find true joy in life comes when your eyes get off of you and they get on your shepherd and they get on helping other people. Amen. Why do you think Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive? It's more blessed to be used of God than to get what God has for you. Amen. And I know that firsthand. I know most of you do. Can you say amen? amen. So am I, am I upsetting anybody? Tell somebody he's not mad at you. Listen, man, I love you, man. I love every one of you. Do you, do you understand what it does to a pastor? Do you not? Do you, not I, you don't because you're not a pastor, but, you know, some of your parents could somewhat relate. Do you know how much it hurts a pastor to watch people in his church that have been with him for years still walking in deception, still walking in bondages to things? I don't look down on anybody. It hurts me to see that you're still walking in something you could be free from. Don't you want to get free from that? Well, yeah, I do. And, you know, just to touch on this for a minute, all right? For years, I used to, I used to have this thought, why is it, Lord, that certain ones, I mean, they do. They, they turn their life over to you. You become their shepherd. They start walking out what God has for them. You see their growth in their life. You see their family change. You see their life change, man. You see their countenance change. Life becomes totally different to them. Now they're seeing things through the mind of Christ, man. All of a sudden stuff begins to look half full instead of half empty. Look at the beautiful flowers. Look at the people that I need to reach and touch. Look at this hurting person over here. Not look at this slob, this idiot, this white trash. Or whatever you want to call them that the world calls them. No, man, that's a hurting soul. They need somebody just as bad as I needed somebody to come into their life named Jesus. What, what changes that? And obviously it's, a total, it's total yielding to Jesus as the shepherd of our life. So for a long time, I kept thinking, well, you know, but some people's backgrounds, Lord, that's probably affected them. It's probably been because if certain ones wouldn't have gone through certain things, you know, then obviously if there's some way we could get them free from that past and, and get them, you know, out of that past that we could obviously get them to walk out the same thing that obviously everybody else has for some reason gotten beyond that walked out. And that sounded about as stupid as me trying to explain that to you. <laughs> The Lord says it's not their past, it's a choice, son. Right. It's a choice. It is. They choose to chase what they want to chase every day. They, they, they will complain about, oftentimes believers, they'll complain about having to come to church all the time and stuff, but they won't complain about going to their ball game. They won't complain about going to their movie. They won't go complain about going with their play toys or going with their friends or going to other stuff. But they'll complain about, and he says, son, it's a choice. It is. Years ago, am I okay? Yes. I should ask if you are. <laughs> years ago, the Lord, the Lord talked to me years ago one time, and he said, if you could ever pursue me as much as you pursue your bull riding, if you ever made that as important, to, if you ever made me as important to your life, actually, if you ever made me more important to your life than you do your bull ride, if you could pursue me with that kind of passion, that kind of heart, that kind of desire, boy, could I change your life. Oh, amen. And he was right. It's amazing how much we'll pursue stuff that has no eternal value to it. Right. But the thing that does, we tend to not make a priority. Can you say amen? amen? What do we need to do, church? We need to make Jesus the shepherd of our life. Can you say amen? amen. Go to Galatians with me quickly. Galatians chapter 3. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Galatians chapter 3. I want to give you three keys tonight. I want to leave you three keys to Jesus being your shepherd. I won't probably finish them tonight. I'll come back on it on Sunday. That's the benefit of being a pastor. I will be back. Uh, I want to give those three to you tonight, though, for study purposes of explaining the key of having Jesus as a shepherd. Number one, 
you got to hear his voice. Everybody say, you got to hear his voice. What's the primary first focus of a shepherd? He's calling out his sheep. They hear his voice and they follow after him. Jesus tells us that very clearly right here of an issue that we got to look at. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Hold your place in Galatians 3. I need to get there. Go to John 10 for a minute, sorry. Go to John 10 and then we'll come back over to Galatians 3. John 10 first. John 10, if you're not very well hearsed in the Bible or haven't had a lot of study time in the New Testament yet, is a powerful chapter you ought to study. The first nine uh, verses talk about a shepherd of a pastor, not Jesus, <clears throat> called by Jesus and anointed by Jesus to shepherd you. That's included in Jesus being your shepherd. But I want to drop below that and focus on the good shepherd. In other words, the ultimate over shepherd of our, of our life, Jesus Christ. Verse 11 Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Now, he distinguishes himself different from what he said through the first, first nine verses as a shepherd coming through him the door. That would be me, one anointed by Jesus, five uh, full ministry gifts to be a shepherd over your life. Eleven, I'm the good shepherd. Say, Jesus is the good shepherd. <clears throat> that don't make me the bad shepherd. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know that. Good shepherd means the over shepherd, the ultimate shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd does what? He gives his life for the sheep. Yes. That's right. There is a similarity because I've laid down everything of my life to shepherd this church. Yes. Amen. I laid down bull riding. I've laid down all my desires, all my wants, all my flesh, all my past, all my time. My time is consumed with shepherding. My time is consumed with pastoring. Hallelujah. I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating and I'm not, ha I'm not uh, in any way unhappy about it at all. I'm fulfilling right. God's call in my life. But there's a similarity. You lay your life down. You lay your life down of things that you would normally do and places you would normally go and things you'd normally get to experience in life because you're a shepherd. You have responsibilities. You've got to take care of a flock. Amen. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Drop down to verse 27 for the sake of time. My sheep, watch this. He's about to give you the three keys that I told you I'd give you. And then we'll, we'll preach on them some more Sunday. My sheep. Whose sheep? Jesus's. My sheep, underline it, number one, hear my voice. Watch this. Number two, I know them. Notice he didn't say they know me. See, how do you know Jesus is your shepherd? He knows you. Well, he already does. Uh, we'll find out about that in just a minute. Three, they follow me. See, three things that make Jesus our shepherd. One, we hear his voice. Two, he knows us. Three, we follow him. It still amazes me today how much the word Christian has been misused in our society right. as a whole. We're a Christian because I prayed a prayer. That don't make you a Christian. Right. Makes you born again if you had God and saw, but that don't make you a Christian. First time the word was ever used was the ninth chapter book of Acts. It was about Paul and Barnabas. And the term was given by the Antiochs of, uh, of the Antioch church in Antioch. They were watching Paul and Barnabas do the very things Jesus did. They saw him preaching the gospel, just like they saw Jesus do it. They saw him laying hands on the sick. People were getting healed. They saw him casting out demons. They saw him doing all the things that Jesus himself did. And the Antioch said, these are those Christ followers. The word we have in the English is Christian. Right. And we all claim to be Christians because we prayed a prayer and got born again or sit in a church. That no more makes you a Christian than sitting in a garage makes you a car. <laughs> Christian means I'm following Christ. I got born again, not just to get a ticket to heaven. I got born again to follow him. I got born again to have him as more than just my savior. I got born again to have him as my shepherd to let him lead me now, to let him guide me now. Truth is, there's basically two shepherds in the earth. There's God and there's the devil. Because those are the two gods that are in this system in the world. There's two systems in the world. There's the world system, there's the kingdom of this world, and there's God's system. There's the kingdom of God. There's an overlord over the kingdom of God, and there's an overlord over the kingdom of the world. Which do you want to be under? I know which one I want to see under. I want to see under the kingdom of God. It's a lot funner. A lot better way to live. Thank God we can be. I said, thank God we can be. Now, don't forget my statement. You're not going to earn anything from him, but you're going to learn from him how to walk out that kind of life. You must learn how to. Right. Getting born again is just the start. Now we learn how to actually become what he called us to be, praise God. Yeah. Cool part about it is he gave the ability. It's inside you. Yeah. It's not your strength or ability that makes it happen. It's his. It's his anointing that makes it happen, actually. But it's you being obedient and doing what he's telling you to do that releases that ability in you. So realize very clearly what Jesus is saying in verse 27 is, here's how you'll know my sheep. Everybody say his sheep. His sheep. 
So if we're not doing these, we're not his sheep. But we can change that. I said we can change that. So don't look at this and say, well, that ain't me. No sense of coming back. No, 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 no. You should say, hey, I'm going to change that. Praise the Lord. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, when I was still riding bulls, Jesus was not my ultimate shepherd. Right. Satan was still my ultimate shepherd because bull riding was my God. Right. And God had to reveal that to me. Right. He had to be the one to show it to me. I didn't feel, I didn't in the, in the sense feel like God was mad at me when he showed me. I felt bad because of how I'd been living a lie and didn't realize it. That I was living in a deception. But you know what? I didn't feel hurt by God. I was, I was a little angered at myself. But it was like an eye opener to me. It was like, wow, man, you're right. I need to fix this. Amen. So the good part about it is we can fix it. That's right. And when you follow the, the true shepherd, Jesus, the good shepherd, guess where you're going to wind up? Green grass. Amen. Still waters. Amen. At the table. Amen. Partaking of all he's prepared right. right in the midst of your enemies. Right. Can you say Amen. amen. So recognize what Jesus is saying here. If you're my sheep, you'll do three things. Hear my voice. Two, I will know you. Yes. Not you'll know me, I will know you. Three, guess what else? You'll follow me. You know what that means? You'll be like an Acts 9 Christian. Amen. You'll be like a Paul and Barnabas. You'll be doing what I did. You won't just go to church because Jesus did. Luke chapter 4, verse 13 says his custom was every Sabbath day he was in the synagogue. Amen. And it was an all-day affair. So realize that we do follow in his footsteps in those things, but the ultimate truth of following him is we're doing what he did. We're preaching the gospel, man. We're getting people born again. We're getting people healed and well and delivered and set free from demonic powers and lies and deceptions and stress and worry and fear and all this junk that Satan's trying to hold people in bondage to. I like a better. Amen. amen. So recognize those three keys. Can you say amen? amen. Let me touch on the first one because we'll run out of time, but I'll just talk about it briefly. To hear his voice here in the Greek means that you and I yield obedience to him. We yield obedience to him. So it's not just hearing what he says. Obviously, that doesn't make me a sheep just to hear what he says. I got to hear what he says, but the reason I'm hearing it is to do what? Follow it. Right. So the key number one here, to hear his voice means I yield obedience to him. I yield obedience to him. Three things here I want to show you real quick. Number one, the first one has to do with what you're listening to. To hear his voice has everything to do with who has your ear, what you're listening to. Okay? Two, second thing he said is, I will know you. Say, he will know me. That has to do with what your hands are doing, as you'll see on Sunday. It has to do with your lifestyle. Remember, who, remember who's going to go in the rapture? He who has a pure heart and clean hands. See, that second thing has to do with what you're doing. The first one has to do with what you're hearing. Second one has to do with what you're doing. I won't confuse you. One, you've got to hear his voice. That has to do with what you're listening to. Right. Two, what you're yielding in obedience to. Two, guess what else we need to know? We need to know that he knows me. That has to do with what I'm doing with my lifestyle. Right. Three, I also want to be following his footsteps. This has to do with what your desire is set on. So those are the three keys that go along with these. All right? Yes. Amen? Amen? I don't want to overload you, but my strength as a teacher is I'm going to give you the whole nuts and bolts about the deal. So let's make sure you got it. How many want Jesus as your shepherd? Could I see your hand? Yes. All right. Here's the key. Number one, guess what? I got to hear his voice. What's that mean? What are you listening to? Right. It will amaze you how easy if you start listening to the wrong things without even realizing it, it begins to lead you away under another shepherd, yes, under another overlord of one you don't want to be under. And, you, didn't, and you, you probably didn't make a decision to say, I want to serve Satan today. But just by allowing what you're listening to, right. it can affect all of a sudden who, who you begin to follow after. Yes. Two, you got to watch what you're doing with your hands. Because again, we want him to know us. And that has to do with what we're doing with our lifestyle, as you'll see on Sunday. And then three, I want to follow after him. That has to do with what your desire is set on. Right. Is your desire set on him? Because if your desire is set on him, you're not going to follow after him. Amen? Amen? All right, go to he, uh, excuse me, Galatians real quick. Let me just briefly touch on this one. We're already out of time. Uh, uh, believe it or not, I'm not going to preach a five-hour sermon. That's how many hours I miss preaching, five hours. I'm just going to give you an hour tonight. Galatians chapter 3. So the first key is i got to hear his voice, which means what? I'm going to yield obedience to him. Now, I know some, I'm already doing that. Praise God. But let's make sure you keep doing that. 
And I'll get on this more Sunday about some guards to obviously protect your life with. How many understand as you go through life, man, if you're not careful, if you don't pay attention to what you're doing, man, seriously, we saw it, you know, for six days on the road. How often do you just drive down the road in Dallas, Fort Worth and see somebody drifting off the road? Huh? They're not paying attention. See, if you don't pay attention to what you're listening to, if you don't pay attention to what your hands are doing, if you don't pay attention to what your heart's set on, you can start drifting off course without even realizing it. And the problem is if you wake up late, guess what? It's going to be too late. Thank God it's not yet in Jesus' name. Galatians 3, we're dealing on the first one, yielding obedience to him to listen to his voice. My sheep hear my voice. Watch this. Galatians 3, verse 1, Paul to the Galatian church, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That's what the King James says. Bewitched here means who led you into error? Underline or circle the word who. Put parentheses around it. Point arrows at it. It's never a what. It's never a what. It's always a who. Now, maybe it could be some famous celebrity. Maybe it could be some wrong friend. Maybe it could be some wrong person you're listening to on the radio or on television. But it's always a who that mis- misleads you into error. Everybody say it. Whoever has my ear has my heart. If my heart doesn't stay set on Jesus, he's not going to be the shepherd of my life. Right? right? And what's influencing that? What I'm listening to. What I'm listening to. So very carefully, Paul tells this Galatian church because he had taught them about relationship with Jesus. He had taught them about salvation through grace and actually how to actually walk that out in obedience to him. But they went totally back to upholding all the Old Testament law. Right. You know why? Because they started listening to some of the religious leaders who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. Yes. All foolish Galatians who has led you into error that you should not obey what? Tell me. What's the truth? The Word of God. If I am yielding obedience to Jesus, what am I yielding obedience to? The truth. The Word of God. See, what causes me to no longer yield obedience to this? You're listening to something other than this. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that could even be that you're not taking time to listen to this. If I'm not listening to the truth, I'm certainly not hearing the truth. I'm not hearing the shepherd that I need to hear. Can you say amen? Amen. All foolish Galatians who bewitched you, you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. So tell your neighbor, you got to watch who you listen to. Now I'm going to tell you something. That includes music. That includes movies. That includes friendships. That Hey, um, if Jesus is the shepherd of your life, you're a man and woman of faith. You're a man and woman of faith. If you're listening to horoscopes, you're listening to a voice. You're listening to a who. My Bible says in the book of Romans, whatever's not of faith is sin. Listen, I'm not supposed to go by what I found in the, uh, um, what's the cookie that you get? I'm not supposed to go by what I get in the fortune cookie. <laughs> now, now, don't raise your hand. Uh, this is a question, but I don't want a response on this one, okay? How many of you get these emails from people that say, if you don't respond, if, excuse me, let me back up. If you'll respond in the next 30 seconds, God will bless you. Oh, I better do that. <laughs> Send the deal. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not faith. Now, there's some teachings that say, well, luck and Lucifer, they kind of are the same thing. Luck comes from Lucifer. Honest truth is, origin of the word luck can't be traced back to Lucifer. But the fact is, we don't have luck in life. There's no such thing as luck or fortune or good fortune in the sense that, hey, I opened up a cookie, man. Says this is going to be a great week for me. Praise God. who, Who do you think is trying to mislead you off into all that other stuff? And here's a word for you. If you're not putting faith in your God... It's a sin. Right. Now, don't get feeling bad about that. What it means is you're not going to get what God has at the table for you. Right. You know why a lot of Christians aren't getting blessed? Oh, come on, man. I got family members that load my email box up. I, I so badly want to remove them from my email box, but, you know, 
one of them's a very close family member that I can't do that to. I just don't, I just don't read them. I just delete them. I used to, oh, Lord, man. I had one of uh, another family member in our church got my text, got my, my number. Man, they text me all the time with these stinking texts they'd get from other people. You got to respond in 15 minutes or something bad will happen to you. If you, don't, if you don't send this to 12 people in the next 30 seconds, uh, you know, your, your car is going to fall apart or I don't know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, everything that directs you away from putting your faith in God is a shepherd that you don't want to follow. Can you say amen? amen. God is the one Hallelujah. who is to be the shepherd of our life, amen. who will lead us to the green pastures, amen. who will lead us by the still waters and bring us to the very table he's prepared. Amen. Could I get a better amen? amen? What's the key? You and I got to learn to listen to this voice above every other. And I got a word for you. Some of you need to get rid of some of the voices you're listening to. Yeah. Right. Good. Yeah. And I want to get on that, but I got to quit. But you got to be very careful who your friends are. It amazes me how many people, you know, say, boy, this person did me bad again. I got this, this friend over here, man, they're saying all this bad stuff about me, these friends over here. I said, I wouldn't be calling those friends. I'd be getting some new friends. Well, I wouldn't have any. Hey, you'd be better off without any than the ones you got. Whoever has this, ladies and gentlemen, has this right here. They have your heart. They're filling your system with a belief. And if it's not from God, it's not going to build faith in God. Amen. Faith comes by hearing this. Amen. So you, and this is all, that's close right. That's, that's, that's religion. That's bondage, man. You're putting us in bondage. No, no, putting you in bondage to stop listening to garbage. I don't guess you've ever heard the old saying, garbage in. That ain't hard to figure out. The Lord told me one time, he said, son, you're in a fallen world. You're going to hear enough junk just going through it without even trying to. Amen. Why do you want to add more to it on your own volition? Yes. I, I quit. I'm like Dr. Barclay. I quit allowing uh, church, uh, ticked off church family members to puke on me. I, I, stopped them from, I stopped them from using this as trash cans. It's amazing how many people, when they want to leave you, now they want an hour-long conversation with you to tell you all the reasons you're leaving. They're leaving. I love you. I'm sorry you're leaving, wish you wouldn't, praise God, but uh, I'm not meeting with you. Well, you ought to. Why? Where in the Bible does it say, because you're leaving me, I'm supposed to meet with you? I have a word for you. Jesus talked to a rich young ruler who walked away from him. And he didn't give him an hour then to tell him why he was walking away from him, nor did he chase him down. I'm not anti-anybody. I love everybody. I don't want to see anybody go. But I learned these aren't trash cans, and I'm going to sit there and let you. I, I used to. I, I used to let people come, and you know what I'd do for the hour, right? I'd try to convince them not to leave. Do you know how many times it worked? Zero. I learned something. They're going to leave. They're going to leave. I wish they wouldn't. I wish everybody would stay. I wish everybody would just love one another and have a blast serving God and growing God and have a wonderful time under the shepherd. They could, they were called, now, if they weren't called to me as a shepherd, go find him. But it's amazing to me how many people know that this was where they were called to, and they're not here. Now, I'm not putting anybody down. I'm just saying you got to be careful what you're listening to. Because Jesus wants to shepherd our life, man. There's nobody better. He knows the exact route to take you through, guys. Every one of you. Listen, every one of you, God's got a different route for your life, but he knows exactly how to get you through it. That's why the Bible says don't compare yourself to one another. That's foolishness. To, to look at what somebody else goes through and thinking, I got to go through that. No, man. God, listen, God's going to probably take you a whole different route. Now, that, I'm not telling you God takes you through hard stuff to get you work. No, I'm talking about dealing with your flesh. Yes. I'm not talking about taking you through, you know, bringing some kind of bad disease or sickness on you. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about dealing with your flesh. I'm talking about dealing with the things that's hindering your life. God wants you to have the peace, the joy, the love, all that he is manifested in and through your life as a part of the fruit of your life every day. Not stress, not worry, not fear. Come on, church. He wants you to know if you woke up and you looked at your checking account today and there was only a dollar in it, by the end of the day you'd still have what you need and you don't have any reason to worry about it. Amen. And I don't mean because you're mismanaging your money. No. Come on, man. Right? We're not talking about you just wastefully doing with it that you shouldn't do with it. But if you're doing what the Bible says, it doesn't mean you're always going to have a million dollars in the bank. It means that God's always going to come through for me. How many know that God can always come through you if I'm making him the shepherd of my life? Can you say amen?
This concludes another message from the ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. If you would like to find out more about us or contact Pastor Baker to have him as a guest speaker, just visit us on the web at cffchurch.com. That's cffchurch.com. You will also find many great resources that will help you further your walk with God. You can also contact our ministry by phone at 817-491-0624. That's 817-491-0624. Thank you.